Greetings, and thank you for joining the Greater Milwaukee Committee. My name is Dr. John Raymond. I'm the president and CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin and a member of the Greater Milwaukee Committee. My purpose today is to give you an update about the latest COVID-19 surge, especially with regard to southeastern Wisconsin. We'll be sharing some data with you today that were current as of late afternoon, August 11th, 2021. I'd also like to express my best wishes to the members of the GMC and other employers in the region who during this latest surge of the COVID-19 pandemic strive to balance the health and safety of their employees, customers, and stakeholders with the special needs of their businesses. And many of our largest employers have decided to mandate vaccinations and other mitigations for on-site workers. And those include the major health systems in the region, Northwestern Mutual, and Manpower. And those were weighty and difficult decisions that were made to protect the health and the safety of our community. I go to the next slide, please. This slide shows data from August 11th, uh, next slide, please, 2021. Um, the data today that I looked at, uh, which is August 12th, look very similar. So we have had five days of over a thousand cases of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. And th those numbers are the highest that we've seen in the last six months. And the trajectory of the pandemic is unfavorable, trending toward higher numbers of cases. We move to the middle of the top part of the slide, our positivity rate per person is 7.1%. And ideally we wanna have that be significantly below 5%. Going to the right-hand side of the slide, the reproductive number, which is a measure of contagiousness, remains above one. It's 1.06, and it's been as high as 1.9 over the last week. Point the Wisconsin is to other states. On the lower left, you can see that we are having a 158% increase in the number of cases reported over the last two weeks. That ranks us as the 10th worst state in the country. Moving to the middle of the bottom, you can see that we've had 160% increase over the last 14 days in the number of hospitalizations in Wisconsin. And that ranks us as the second worst state behind Vermont. And then going to the right-hand side of the lower part of the slide, you can see that we rank 21st in terms of completed vaccination series. And that's actually going in the wrong direction. For quite a long time early in the year, Wisconsin was leading the pack, consistently being in the top five in, the, in the terms of the number of vaccinations given. And then we slid down into the top 10 and successively over the last two months, pack. Next slide, please. Despite the surging number of cases and the increase in hospitalizations that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, the number of deaths have not gone up significantly. We're averaging anywhere between one and two deaths in Wisconsin per day. That is going up though. Um, it's trending toward two. And last week we were experiencing less than one per day. And that's not unexpected because there's typically a lag of between four and six weeks between new cases and deaths. And we're hoping with half of it, that that surge in deaths will not mimic what we saw toward the end of last year during the November surge here in Wisconsin. Moving toward the top middle of the slide, you see that we have 525 hospitalizations in Wisconsin. That's trending favorably, as I mentioned on the previous slide but is nowhere near the peak levels that we experienced last November when we had nearly 2,300 people with COVID-19 hospitalized in Wisconsin hospitals. Our ICU census is at 156. That also is trending significantly upward, although we still haven't reached the levels that we saw in November 2020. Milwaukee numbers are very similar. Um, we have 263 hospitalizations here in the region and 90 in the ICU. Again, trending unfavorably. Next slide, please. This shows some screenshots from the Wisconsin DHS website and it shows in pictorial form the trajectory of the pandemic at various points in time. 
We peaked with very severe case burdens back in November, as you can see on the left, with 66 of our counties critically high, as shown in red, and the other six counties at very high levels. Moving toward the right, you can see that there was a decline in the number of cases in most of our counties. Uh, and just a little over a month ago, we were looking quite good with low or medium burdens in most of our counties. Although we did see some early signs that we may be going in the wrong direction at that time because the trajectories were turning unfavorable. And you can see the manifestation of that on the far right-hand side of the slide where we have high case burdens in 68 of our 72 counties and very high case burdens in four with unfavorable trajectories in most of our counties. And I wanna draw your attention to the lower right-hand side of that panel on the right showing the red circle. Those are our counties here in Southeastern Wisconsin, uh, Ozaki, Milwaukee, and Waukesha. So for the moment, we really are the epicenter of COVID-19 in our state. Next slide, please. Most of you are familiar by the CDC and was proposed by the World Health Organization about two months ago. This makes it easier for us to track significant variant strains of COVID-19. And those are listed using the Greek alphabet. There are four variants of concern. In other words, variants that have been demonstrated to have unfavorable changes in their biology or epidemiology. And those are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And recall that the surge in late 2020 and early 2021 was driven primarily by alpha variant, which was also called the UK variant. Dominant variant is the delta variant that was first spotted in India. I'm going to talk a little bit later about what has changed about the biology of Delta that makes it so difficult for us to manage. I'd also like to call your attention to the bottom of the slide, where we show another series of variants that are listed in blue that are called variants of interest. In other words, they have mutations that could alter the biology in unfavorable ways, but which has, as of yet, have not been demonstrated to be significantly more virulent or contagious in the United States. And the one that we're following very closely is the Lambda, which is the last one listed on the slide, which originated in Peru um, and has been, uh, has been isolated in many countries throughout the world, and which may in fact be more contagious and have some unfavorable characteristics that require us to monitor. Next slide, please. Now I do wanna talk about Delta because that constitutes more than 95% of the cases in the US right now. It is the most transmissible strain thus far. It's kind of a game changer. It's twice as infectious or twice as contagious as the alpha strain, which was twice as contagious as the strains that we were seeing early in the pandemic. And unfortunately, Delta can be spread very easily by asymptomatic individuals. But we've also, over the last several years, it's troubling news that the Delta variant can actually be spread by fully vaccinated individuals. However, the transmission risk is reduced by about 50%, but it's still a very significant risk. That's why the CDC and other experts recommend that fully vaccinated individuals still should wear a mask or others. So trying to prevent the potential spread from individuals to other individuals. What else is different and is troubling about is when you measure the number of viral mouth, nose, and throat, uh, the nasal viral load, they're very much higher than the others we've seen earlier in the pandemic, on the order of 100 to 1,000 times higher. Because the number of viral particles you're has a direct you get infected and how severe the infection by through infections. That's manifested by the reproductive number or the measure of contagiousness, uh, which is much higher for Delta than for other strains, and it's ranging between four and eight. What that would mean is that for a single individual who's infected with COVID-19, 
they pass that on to between It's also troubling for us is that the symptoms of Delta have changed compared to other COVID variants earlier in the pandemic. They're more subtle, maybe milder. And these would include headache, sneezing, runny nose and sore throat, the kind of symptoms that you might experience if you have a mild cold or a flare of allergies. This is very different than earlier in the pandemic when the primary symptoms were shortness of breath, cough, fever, and chest pain. We're also learning about the Delta variant that it does increase the likelihood of hospitalization, roughly about twofold. So if you're infected and you're unvaccinated, your risk of hospitalization now has doubled compared to earlier in the pandemic. And we're also seeing that Delta is able to infect younger people and make them sicker more quickly, hence the phrase younger, sicker, quicker to describe Delta. We also know that Delta has partially escaped from vaccine immunity. And I wanna emphasize that partial word, that vaccines still give excellent protection against COVID-19 for the things that matter, but you must complete the full course of the mRNA vaccines to achieve a 90% protection. And that would be the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. And as I mentioned, Delta constitutes more than 90% of the cases in the US as of today. Next slide, please. Also some troubling news about Delta. Um, we do know now for certain that there is outdoor transmission possible with the Delta variant. Predominantly though, in tightly packed crowds where people are shouting, singing, or celebrating with prolonged exposure in mixed crowds with people that may not be wearing masks or may not be vaccinated against COVID-19. And some examples you can see here on the upper left, a now rather infamous picture called the Where's Waldo picture from Lollapalooza in Chicago, 2021, from which over 200 potential transmissions have been identified. And then two music festivals, one in Pendleton, Oregon in the upper right, the Whiskey Music Fest, and on the bottom left, the Faster Horses Festival in Brooklyn, Michigan, have each been associated with significant numbers of transmission of COVID-19. Next slide, please. And we're not immune to transmission here. We see um, our well-deserved celebration of the Milwaukee Bucks National Championship. Um, and you can see here many crowds that were celebrating in tightly packed spaces, shouting and cheering, were with each other for a long time many not wearing masks, and many certainly not vaccinated against COVID-19. And there are over 500 cases that are being tracked for potential linkage to, uh, to this event. Next slide, please. And this next slide just shows another picture. You can imagine how tightly packed people were and the fact that they were together for a long period of time, shouting, uh, celebrating, possibly expelling large amounts of viral particles into the air. You can see why uh, there could have been transmissions. Next slide, please. Now, I do wanna address some questions that naturally arise from the data that I spoke of earlier, which is if vaccinated individuals still can get COVID-19 and they can spread it to other people, why bother getting the shot? I wanna go back to the things that matter the most. The COVID-19 vaccines reduce your chance of getting severe disease or to be hospitalized by greater than 90%. The COVID-19 vaccines also prevent COVID-19 related deaths by far greater than 99%. So these vaccines protect you from bad outcomes from COVID-19. And they slightly reduce the risk that if you get a breakthrough infection, that you'll pass it on to other people. So then the natural question that follows is why do vaccinated people need to wear masks and practice other mitigation measures like limiting out, uh, exposures outside of your home uh, and wearing masks? And that's because the masks protect those around us. That's called source control. In other words, if you have a breakthrough infection and maybe have mild symptoms or not really know that you have a breakthrough infection, you won't pass that on to people around you. And because vaccinated individuals can have mild symptoms or no symptoms with their COVID-19 infection, 
they can pass that on to vulnerable individuals inadvertently. That's why we recommend continuation of other mitigation measures to add extra layers of protection for yourself, but most importantly, for those around you if you're fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. And then finally, looking to the future, because I know a lot of us are frustrated. COVID-19 continues to change. It's a shape-shifting virus. As science advances, we learn more and more about COVID-19. And we have to change our perspective. Sometimes people feel that we're moving the goalposts. So I want to just give you some anticipatory insights about threats in the future and maybe some promising developments that can mitigate those threats. First of all, I think the biggest current threat continues to be a lack of vaccine confidence. Our vaccination rates still remain low, although they're picking up a bit, um, and only half of our population has been vaccinated. We need to get shots in every arm possible, and we need to treat people that have questions with respect and do our very best to make sure that we answer their questions so that we can create vaccine confidence to help us get on the other side of the pandemic. We're also tired. All of us have been at this for 18 months. Our personal and community vigilance has been relaxed. We don't wanna wear masks. We wanna be with people. We don't wanna distance, we wanna connect. We don't wanna avoid crowds. We wanna congregate, especially during the social time during the summer. And our kids are going back to school. So that's a threat. The continuing emergence of newer COVID-19 variants that can change our perspective in a very short period of time just like Delta has done over the last two months, is going to be a threat for the foreseeable future because until the whole world is fully vaccinated, there is the opportunity for the shape-shifting virus to continue to mutate and generate more virulent and more contagious strains of itself. And this is a particular problem in the Southern Hemisphere, in poor countries, in Africa, in Asia, and in South America, where there really isn't access to vaccines right now. So this is gonna be a problem that could boomerang back to us, even if in the United States, we're able to get on the other side of the pandemic. Now, let's talk about some potential good news. Uh, the FDA is expected to give full approval for the mRNA vaccines within a matter of weeks. I anticipate that the Pfizer vaccine will be given full approval by the end of August or the first week in September, and that the Moderna vaccine will follow shortly thereafter. We also expect within a week or so that booster shots will be approved for the most vulnerable populations in our communities, uh, probably people that are immunocompromised, perhaps because they're receiving cancer immunotherapy, cancer chemotherapy, or they have an autoimmune disease or HIV, or patients that are over the age of 60. And so that is potential good news. It'll give us an extra layer of protection in our community to the most vulnerable patients. And then finally, extremely exciting news. Uh, Pfizer has a promising oral protease inhibitor that's completing phase two and three trials to use as either a prophylactic or an early phase mild COVID-19 infections. And these studies have shown great promise. And this is important because protease inhibitors are a type of drug that really helped us get hepatitis C and HIV under control. And the proteases that they target are less likely to be able to mutate, unlike the spike protein of COVID-19. These proteases are essential to the replication of the virus, and therefore there really isn't a whole lot of room for the virus to, to mutate that protease. So these could be sustainable and viable targets that could really be a game changer for us in terms of developing therapeutics that we can use early in the course of COVID-19 infection. And next slide, please. And this slide lists some of the data sources that our team at the Medical College of Wisconsin uses to put together these presentations. And again, I wanna express my gratitude to you for your attention and to the Greater Milwaukee Committee for their leadership. Thank you.